that we are conducting in Aboriginal Hospital in Karachi. So, so the contents of today's sessions, uh, we will be studying the foramen magnum anatomy in five components. We will first deal with the osseous anatomy, then we'll move on to muscular anatomy, followed by ligament anatomy, neuronal anatomy, and then we will deal a little bit with the vascular anatomy. So to start with the foramen magnum, we know it's an opening. So it has contents. So the way I used to remember it in medical school was a mnemonic. It's vampire saying at midnight. So the contents of foramen magnum are vertebral artery, anterior spinal artery, meningeal artery, posterior spinal artery, spinal part of accessory nerve, apical ligament, tectorial membrane, and medial organ. So you, are going, you can remember this by the mnemonic. So what is foramen magnum and what is osseous anatomy? The foramen magnum is a Latin word for great bone. It is located in the occipital bone, where which has three parts, a squamosal part, a basal part, and a condylar part. A squamosal part is located behind the foramen magnum. The basal part, which is also known as the clavicle portion, is located anterior to the foramen magnum. And there's a condylar part, which connects the squamosal and clavicle parts. So if we look at the bony anatomy we are looking at the base of the skull we are looking it from uh, behind we are looking it from downwards this is going to be anterior and this is posterior uh, this is right of the patient this is left we are seeing from below and we can see that this is the foramen magnum the great opening and as we can see it is bounded posteriorly by the squamosal part of the occipital bone anteriorly by the basal part or the clavicle part of the occipital bone and laterally, we have occipital condyles. This part is known as the condylar part, which connects the clavicle part and the squamosal part. The occipital bone surrounds the foramen magnum. The foramen opening is oval shaped and is wider posteriorly than anterior. As we can see, it kind of looks like an egg. It's short or less wider anteriorly as compared to posteriorly. The wider posterior part transmits the medulla. And the narrower anterior part sits above the odontoid process. The squamosal part, which we saw that forms the posterior part of the foramen magnum, is an internally concave plate located above and behind the foramen magnum. Its upper margins articulate with the parietal bone at the lumboid suture, and its lower margin articulate with the mastoid portion of the temporal bone at the occipital mastoid suture. So, uh, as we can appreciate here, that this is the posterior view we are seeing viewing from the behind so we can see that this is the uh, squamosal part of the occipital bone it's going to be articulating with the mastoid process laterally and parietal bone superiorly the convex external surface has several prominences on which the muscles of the neck attach the largest prominent which is known as the external occipital protuberance or inion is situated at the central part of the external surface inferior margin of the confluence of sagittal and transverse signs. So as we can see here, there are many different markings on the external surface, but the largest one, the most prominent one is known as external occipital protuberance or inion. Now that was the external surface of the squamosal part of the occipital bone. Now the internal surface of squamous part is concave and is divided into four unequal fossa by the sulcus of the superior sagittal sinus that extends upward from the protuberance, the internal occipital crest, a prominent ridge that descends from the protuberance, and the paired sulci for the transfer cells. So this is a picture taken from 3D anatomy. And as you can see, we are viewing from the inside. So uh, this is the inside of the squamosal part of the occipital bone. This is the suture that is differentiating occipital bone from the parietal bone. And this is the occipital mastoid suture separating occipital bone from the mastoid bone. And as we can see that the inside of the squamosal surface of the occipital bone is divided into four unequal fossa by an, a, a transverse ridge, which basically uh, correlates with the transverse sinus. And as we can see, this is the ridge of the superior sagittal sinus. So it's divided into four unequal fossa. So pierce sagittal sinus ridge and by the uh, paired sulcus of the transverse. And this, this crest is the internal occipital crest. Now the upper two fossa are adapted to the poles of the occipital lobe and the inferior two fossa conform to the contours of the cerebral arteries. So 
as we can imagine that here we will have the occipital poles and here in these two fossa we will be having cerebellar uh, poles the annular occipital crest bifurcates above the foramen magnum to form paired lower limbs which extends along each side of the posterior margin of the foramen a depression between the lower limbs the vermin fossa is occupied by the inferior part of the bones so this is what we are talking about that before this internal occipital crest before forming the posterior margin of the foramen magnum it divides into two which and forms a very shallow fossa here which is known as vermin fossa and this is a part where vermin vermis of the cerebellum lies the folk cerebelli is attached along with the internal occipital crest so again a better picture showing the vermin fossa as we can see this is internal occipital crest and this is transverse sinus sulcus it's going to divide and here in the center there will be superior cerebellar sinus sulcus it divides the squamous part of the occipital bone into four unequal fossas and the internal occipital crest before they join the foramen magnum divides into two limbs and in between the two limbs there is a small fossa which is known as vermin fossa and this is a part where vermis of the cerebellum is going to lie and the internal occipital crest is a part of the bone where tentorium cerebelli is going to attach now moving towards the basal part or the clavicular part of the occipital bone which forms the anterior opening anterior wall of the foramen magnum it's a thick quadrangular plate of bone that extends forward and upward at an angle of about 45 degree from the foramen magnum the superior surface of the clavicle is concave from side to side and is separated on each side from the petrous part of the temporal bone by a petroclavicular fissure this fissure has the anterior petrosal sinus on its upper surface and posteriorly at the jugular fold on the inferior surface of the basilar part in front of the foramen magnum a small elevation the pharyngeal tubercle gives attachment to fibrous lapid of the pharynx so as we can see this is the clavicular bone a quadrangular bone forming the anterior wall of the foramen magnum and as we can see it is separated here by the no, petrous bone by the suture a uh, sulcus as we can also see here that here we we will we have the petrosal sinus running that is going to end in the jugular fora we can make that it will be running here and then it will be it will end here in the jugular fora now the paired lateral or condylar parts or the condylar part of the occipital condyles are situated at sides of the foramen magnum the occipital condyles which articulate with the atlas that is the first cervical vertebrae protrude from the external surface of this part these condyles are located lateral to the anterior half of the foramen magnum and the hypoglossal canals which is which transmits the hypoglossal nerve is situated above the condyle and is directed forward and laterally from the posterior femoral fossa so now we are back on the inferior surface or the base of the skull and we can as you can appreciate this is the anterior and this is posterior this was the squamosal part which we learned about a little bit back and this is the clavicle you can see the condylar part which is going to connect the two parts it's made up of the occipital condyles and condyles and they mostly are present at the anterior half of the foramen magnum so if you are going to divide the foramen magnum by imaginary line the condyles are going to be present in the anterior half and as we can see they are in close proximity with the hypoglossal canal here so a better picture to show you that would be this one so as we can see this is foramen magnum and we can see that the hypoglossal canal is present just at the rim of it next to it so moving forward we also have a structure known as condylar fossa which is present on the condylar part of the occipital bone it's a depression located on the external surface behind the condyle as we know that the condyles form the anterior part of the foramen magnum the occipital condylar fossa is present behind them is often perforated to form the posterior condylar canal through which an imaginary vein connects the vertebral venous plexus with the sigmoid sinus we will learn about the venous anatomy of the foramen magnum in the end yes, so moving forward the jugular process a quadrilateral plate of bone is also present on the condylar surface of the occipital bone extends laterally from the posterior half of condyle to form the posterior border of the jugular fossa the jugular foramen is situated laterally and slightly superior to anterior half of the condyles it is bordered posteriorly by the jugular process of the occipital bone and anteriorly and superiorly by the jugular fossa of the petrous portion of the temporal bone 
I'm not going the details of jugular foramen here because uh, we read about jugular foramen in uh, previous presentation. The smaller anterior medial part, the petrous part, transmits the inferior petrosal sinus, and the larger posterior lateral part, the sigmoid part, transmits the sigmoid sinus, as we learned in previous lecture. So as we can make up here, this is the condylar part of the occipital bone. It's going to join the clavicle part and the squamosal part of occipital bone and forms the lateral margin of the foramen magnum. Uh, a greater part of it is formed by the occipital condyle. The other structure that are present on the surface are the condylar fossa, which is sometimes perforated to form a condylar canal. We have a jugular process. We have a jugular foramen here. And we know that the uh, venous structures are present over there. So up till now, we read about the ven uh, osseous anatomy of the occipital bone, which forms a great part of foramen magnum. But we can't... Uh, conclude our discussion on osseous anatomy without discussing about a little bit about C1, which forms the lower border. So as we know that C1 articulates with the occiput and it also forms the lower part of the foramen magnum. A typical C1 vertebrae, as we can see from superiorly, has an anterior arch, a posterior arch, and has a lateral mass formed by the transverse process, transverse foramen. It has a superior articular process that articulates with the occipital condyle that we saw previously. These occipital condyles, they are going, these are going to be articulated with the superior articular facet of C1 to form the occipital cervical joint. So now as we are done with the osseous anatomy, the bony anatomy of the foramen magnum, let's put some muscles on them and learn them. So um, we will start with the step by this dissection of the roton. So in figure A, as we can see, that we have the outermost covering of tibia. Once we remove it, we can see the sternocleidomastoid muscles and trapezius muscles. And we're going to remove these two muscles. The next muscle that we are going to encounter is the spinous capitis major and the semispinalis capitis major. Now, the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius, these superficial muscles, they make the posterior triangle of the head. Another triangle which is very important in the uh, posterior fossa or the for, near the foramen magnum is the suboccipital triangle. We're going to encounter it a little bit later. So moving on forward, if you're going to remove the splenius capitis major muscle here, you will expose the semispinalis capitis major muscle. And if you're going to remove the semispinalis capitis major muscle, you're going to expose a lot of different muscles like, like rectus capitis posterior, in the media, medial portion, you are going to expose the rectus capitis posterior major, in turn, inferior oblique muscle, superior oblique muscles, and semispinalis cervicalis muscle. Now, the suboccipital triangle is this triangle. A triangle, let me. I hope you can see my pointer. This is suboccipital triangle, a triangle of great importance when you read about the foramen magnum. Why? It's bounded by the superior oblique muscle laterally, inferior oblique muscle inferiorly, and rectus capitis posterior minor muscle medially. This triangle here, here rise the, rest the vertebral artery, the extra dural component of the vertebral artery, the V3 component, and spinal SSA now. So moving forward, the suboccipital triangle, which we just saw, is a, saw is a region bounded above and medially by the rectus capitis posterior major, above and laterally by the superior oblique muscles, and below and laterally by the inferior oblique muscles. Let me show you the picture again. So here we can see this is inferior oblique muscle, this one. We can see this muscle, this is superior oblique muscle. And this muscle which is going to bound is medially is rectus capitis posterior minor. It's covered by the semispinalis capitis medially and the splenius capitis laterally. Going back again, as we saw, that was covered by semispinalis capitis medially and a little bit by rectus capitis posterior major. The floor of the triangle is formed by the posterior atlanto occipital membrane and posterior arch of the atlas. The structure in the triangle are the terminal extra dural segment of the vertebral artery and the first cervical. And that is why this triangle is important. Now, moving forwards to ligaments. 
So there are not a lot of ligaments in foramen magnum. Most of the ligaments that we are going to learn here are associated with C1 or the cervical vertebrae. So as you can see from behind, you can see that this is the C1. This is the C2 body. This is going to be the second axis. This is going to be the atlas vertebrae. This part is the occiput or the base of the skull. And this is a membrane, the one which is colored orange here, tectorial membrane, which surrounds it, which covers it. If you're going to remove the tectorial membrane, we can see a transverse ligament running from this border of C1 to this border. We can see an apical ligament running up. We can see LR ligaments or check ligament. If you view it from the uh, sagittal view, we can see that this is going to be the odontoid process of axis. This is axis. We can see the atlas vertebrae, the posterior arch of atlas. We can see the arch of axis, and we can see the C3 vertebrae. We can see the anterior longitudinal ligament running anteriorly. And as it goes up, it's going to be attached as anterior atlanto occipital membrane to the skull. We can see the posterior longitudinal ligament running behind. And as we see it, when it goes up, it's attached as tectorial membrane. We can see that we have a transverse ligament here, which is going to keep this odontoid process of axis in check in its position, the transverse ligament. We can see an apical ligament, which connects the apex of the odontoid process to the occiput. And as we can see that check ligaments or apical ligaments will be present here. So all these ligaments also form the walls of the foramen magnum and they will be present at foramen magnum. Now looking at a cadaveric dissection, just to make things clear, this is a coronal view. We can see the odontoid process of axis. We can see the body of the spinous process, the axis vertebrae itself. Uh, we can see the C1 lateral masses, and we can see occiput here. We can see this is outlanto occipital joint formed by the occipital condyles and the superior articular facet of C1, which we saw a few uh, slides back. We saw the outlanto an axial joint. And if we put on ligaments over here, we can see that we will have a transverse ligament running over here, which will keep this odontoid process in check. And we will have a LR ligament running here and a pical ligament from the tip of odontoid process to the occiput. Just another slide. Uh, now we are viewing it in sagittal plane. We can see the same ligaments as we saw in the previous slide. Now moving forward to the neural structures of the foramen magnum. So the neural structure that are going to locate it in the region of the foramen magnum are the caudal part of the brainstem, cerebellum, fourth ventricle, the rostral part of the spinal cord, and the lower cranial and upper cervical lungs. We will deal with all of them one by one. So moving on with spinal cord. The spinal cords blend indistinguishably into the medulla at a level arbitrarily set to be at the upper limits of dorsal and ventral rootlets, forming the first cervical lung. It is easier to differentiate this level on the ventral than on the dorsal surface because the ventral rootlets of the first cervical nerve are always present, whereas the dorsal rootlets are absent in many cases. The fact that the junction of the spinal cord and medulla is situated at the rostral margin of the first cervical root means that the medulla and not the spinal cord occupies the foramen magnum. So as we can see, it's a very familiar dissection. Uh, we have seen this in uh, many slide, many presentations previously. We can appreciate the lower part of the cerebellum here. We can see the tonsil here. We can see the pica running on the side. Uh, this is going to be the fourth ventricle area. We can see the foramen medullary medially. Lashka will be somewhere here. And as we can see, this is medulla oblongata turning into spinal cord. And as we can see, that cranial nerve 9, 10, 11 are going to be originating from here. They are going to form the inferior complex of the CP angle and CP complex or the neural complex of the CP angle. We can see the atlanto occipital joint here. We can see vertebral artery running from the outside, coming inside the skull and forming the intradural portion. We can see the atlas C1 vertebrae here. So the point to note here is that we have the dorsal and the ventral rootlets of the C1, which are going to originate here. And there's a dentate ligament, which is running here. So uh, what is actually a dentic, dentate ligament? It's a ligament, which is a fibrous sheet that is attached to spinal cord medially and to the dura metal laterally. The medial border of the dentate ligament, which is attached to the pia metal between the dorsal and ventral rootlets along the length of each side of spinal cord, 
represent a series of triangular tooth like processes on each side of the attached at intervals to the duodenum so the dentate ligament usually arises between the dorsal rootlet and the ventral rootlet of the spinal cord at the cranial cervical junction the dentate ligament is located between the vertebral artery and the ventral roots of c1 anteriorly and the branches of posterior spinal artery and spinal accessory nerve posteriorly now look, looking at the magnified view of the diagram we can appreciate this big red structure here this is vertebral artery and the branch that is going to give before it uh, enters is a posterior spinal artery we know that vertebral artery forms the anterior spinal artery and paired posterior spinal arteries which supply the posterior surface of the spinal cord so we can see here that it it gives off the branch is known as posterior spinal artery posterior spinal artery further divides into an ascending branch and a descending branch descending branch is going to run on the surface of the spinal cord inferiorly we can see that this is the dorsal root of c1 dorsal because we are viewing it from behind as we can see this is the ventral root of c1 both roots of c1 they are going to join together to form the c1 nerve and as we can see this white structure this is a dentate ligament it basically arises in between the dorsal and the ventral roots so if i am going to this is basically a median section we can see the dentate ligament here we can see the c2 dorsal root or ventral the ventral root will be behind this dentate ligament we can see the c1 dorsal root ventral root arising from behind it we can see the dentate ligament we can see this red structure going behind dentate ligament which is known as a vertebral artery and if you are going to uh, remove the portion of spinal cord here we can see that this vertebral artery goes behind it and here it gives rise to anterior spinal artery so we have one anterior spinal artery which is median which is central which is given off uh, by the vertebral artery and two posterior spinal arteries which are given on each side as soon as it enters the foramen magnum we are going to deal with it a, lit a little bit later on as well so again a simplified view to make things clear we can see here this is medulla oblongata blanket plank of the spinal cord we can see the uh, dorsal root and the ventral root behind the dentate ligament we can see that between the dorsal and the ventral root we have dentate ligament which is a white fibrous structure arising from the spinal cord here pyometer and going to attach to the dura laterally and this the two so dorsal and the ventral root join together to form the main femur root we can see the vertebral artery going behind the dentate ligament before dividing going behind it it gives off the posterior spinal artery which divides into a descending segment and an ascending segment we can also see the spinal accessory nerve which is present in front or dorsal to the pectoral tentorial ligament same la section further on we can see the two vertebral arteries join together they form the basilar artery and before they give rise to anterior spinal artery which runs in the center here here they have uh, the in this section the whole medulla has been removed and cut off and if you are going to remove this vertebral structures as well we will go at the back and we will see the dense and the pectoral membrane as we saw previously now what happens with the cerebellum so only the lower portion of the hemisphere formed by, formed by the tonsils and the biventral lobules and the lower part of the vomis formed by the nodule uvula and pyramid are related to the foramen magnum the biventral lobule sits above the lateral part of the foramen magnum and the tonsil rests above the level of the posterior edge the cerebellar surface above the posterior part of the foramen magnum has a deep vertical depression the posterior cerebellar incisura which contains the falx cerebelli and extends inferiorly towards the foramen magnum as we can see here only the biventral lobule is going to be attached to the foramen magnum now moving towards cranial nerve the uh, the only cranial nerve that is of some importance with the foramen magnum is cranial nerve 11th or the ssi nerve So this is the nerve is the only cranial nerve that passes through the foramen magnum it has a cranial part composed of the rootlets that arise from the medulla and joins the vagus nerve and a spinal portion formed by the union of a series of rootlets that arise from the lower medulla and upper spinal cord in the posterior fossa this is a nerve is composed of one main trunk from the spinal cord and three to six small rootlets that emerge from the medulla the spinal contribution of the spinal is a nerve arises from the cervical portion of the spinal cord as a series of rootlets situated midway between the ventral and dorsal rootlets 
the lowest level of origin of the rootlets contributing to SSA nerve was at the C7 root level. And we saw the SSRE nerve, spinal SSA nerve here. And it, as you can see, it takes small rootlets, small communication from any cervical level as far below as C7 level. Now the cervical nerve root. They are also related to foramen magnum. So each dorsal and ventral root is composed of a series of six to eight rootlets that fan out to enter the posterior lateral and anterior lateral surface of the spinal cord respectively. The dorsal and ventral roots cross the subarachnoid space and tra transfer the dura mater separately, then unite close to intervertebral foramen to form the spinal nerve. The rootlet in the region of the foramen magnum pass almost directly lateral and reach the dural foramina. The C1 nerve, termed the suboccipital nerve, leaves the vertebral canal between the occipital bone and atlas, as we saw previously. Let me remind the picture again. So as we can see, that C1, C1, dorsal root and the ventral root join together, they form the C1 main nerve. And this is going to leave between the occipital bone and the C1. So this is going to, the C1 nerve, again here, this is C1 nerve, it's going to leave the, uh, between the atlas, that is the C1 vertebrae and the occipital. The first cervical nerve uh, is located just below the foramen magnum, differs from other cervical nerves in the consistency and origin of the dorsal root, just forming the nerve. The C1 ventral root is composed of four to eight rootlets. And before entering the dural foramen, the C1 ventral root and the corresponding dorsal root, if they are present, because sometimes they are absent, attaches to the posterior inferior surface of the initial intradural part of the vertebral artery. And both exit the dural sac through the funnel shaped dural foramen around the vertebral artery. The ventral root join the dorsal root in or external to the ventral foramen if they are present. So, as we can see here, again, this is C2 dorsal root. This is dentate ligament. And as we know from previous slides, that C2 ventral root will be present somewhere here behind the dentate ligament. So, for C1, we know that the dorsal root is present somewhere, somewhere here. And ventral root, if it's going to be present, it will be present somewhere behind it. And as you can see, this is the spinal part of the SSI now. And it's taking some branches, some rootlets from all the level, and it can take branches up the way to C7. And this is going to be the vertebral artery. So sometimes the C1 nerve root, this C1 nerve root exits the, along with the vertebral artery from the neural foramen. So how is vertebral artery related to foramen magnum? Uh, let's just start with a little bit description of the vertebral artery because we haven't done that before. We have paired vertebral arteries which arises from the subclavian arteries. They are sent through the transverse process of the upper six cervical vertebrae. They pass behind the lateral masses of the axis, that is the C1 vertebrae, enters the dura matter behind the occipital condyles, ascend through the foramen magnum to the front of the medulla and join to form the basilar artery at the ponto medullary junction. So basically, vertebral artery is divided into four segments. A V1, which is known as periforaminal segment. This is a part which is going to be arised from the subclavian artery up till it enters the foramen transverse atrium at the level of C6. Then you have a V2 of foraminal component from C6 to C2 that is going to run in the foramen. Then we have a C3, V3 component, which is C3 to dura or extra dural component. And then a V4 or intradural component, which runs inside the dura. Now, these are some complex dissections, but uh, stay with me, we'll learn them. So, the only thing to notice in all these dissections is, is the vertebral artery. So, if you can see here, this is this, this is the front dissection. We can see that we have, this is a carotid artery, we are seeing from behind. Okay? And if we, as we go back, we can see here, we can appreciate the vertebral artery. We can see two vertebral arteries. One, the one on the right is a little bit thicker as compared to the left. This is, as we know, that in the, uh, the vascular anatomy of our body, especially skull, there's sometimes uh, a little bit inconsistent flow. One of the arteries, one, uh, one side is dominant and the other side is non-dominant. As we can see, that this right artery is a dominant and the left is hypoplastic. They are both are going to join together to form the basilar artery. A better picture would be this, a thicker right-sided vertebral artery and a thinner left-sided vertebral artery. They both join together 
and they form the basal arteries on the posterior surface and the point where they join together this is the ponto medullary junction moving forward as we can see step by step we know that uh, the v2 segment runs in the foramen transverse area <laughs> and after it runs at the exit the foramen transverse area of the c2 it runs over the and bends over the c1 there is a groove vertebral foramen vertebral groove present on the superior surface of the v1 or uh, uh, first cervical vertebrae it's going to run into it and then it is going to run inside the skull this component is v3 or the extrapedal component and once it it enters the skull then it becomes the intradural component or the v4 segment from here and then it's going to join the the contralateral vertebral artery to form the basal artery so the intradural segment of the v4 segments begin at the dural foramen just inferior to the lateral edge of the foramen mater the dura in this region is much thicker than in other areas and it forms a funnel shaped foramen around 4 to 6 mm length of the artery so what are we talking about we are talking about this that once it enters the intradural component the thickening of the dura forms a funnel around it in the first 4 to 6 mm of artery the first cervical nerve exits the spinal canal and the posterior spinal artery enters the spinal canal through this dura foramen with the vertebral artery we discussed about this previously that the first cervical nerve c1 is going to exit through the same pore through the same opening the through the same dural opening that is formed around the vertebral artery here these three structures are bound together the foramen of fibrous distal foramen by the fibrous distal band watch these structures the vertebral artery the spinal part of the ssi nerve and the first cranial cervical nerve the initial intradural segment of the vertebral artery passes just superior to the dorsal and ventral roots of the first cervical nerve and just anterior to the posterior spinal artery the dentate ligament <coughs> and the spinal portion of the ssi nerve this this vertebral artery is going to be associated with this the spinal part of the ssi nerve and as we can see the spinal part of ssi nerve is taking branches from a lot of different uh, levels up to the level of c1 and the other nerve that is going to enter exit from here is the c1 the c1 once inside the dura mater the vertebral artery ascends from the lower lateral to the upper anterior surface of the medulla the intradural part of the artery is divided into lateral and inferior medullary segments the lateral medullary segments begin at the dural foramen pass anterior and superior along the lateral medullary surface to terminate at the pre olivary sulcus and the anterior medullary segments begin at the pre olivary sulcus coursing in front or between the hypoglossal rootlets and crosses the pyramid to join with the other vertebral artery and uh, near the ponto medullary sulcus to form the basal artery in its ascending course the anterior and lateral surface of the lateral medullary segments face the occipital condyle and the hypoglossal canal jugular tubercles as we can appreciate the anterior medullary segment rests on the clavus the branches arising from the vertebral artery in the region of foramen magnum are the posterior spinal artery as we saw previously anterior spinal artery pica and anterior and posterior meningeal arteries as you can see here again similar dissection we saw this picture before but now look at how two vertebral arteries join together to form the basal artery at the ponto medullary junction and this this part of the vertebral artery the v4 intradural segment is divided into a medullary segment and a medullary uh, uh, lateral medullary segment and a medial medullary segment And as we can see, both join together to form the anterior spinal artery. And we saw previously that posterior spinal artery arises here. This is posterior spinal artery running here. So, what are the meningeal arteries that we just talked about? The dura mater around the foramen magnum is supplied by the anterior and posterior meningeal branches of the vertebral artery, and the meningeal branches of the ascending pharyngeal and occipital artery. These arteries plus the dorsal meningeal branch. of the meningeal hypophyseal trunk that arises from the intra cavernous segment of the internal carotid artery supply all of the dura lining the posterior cranial fossa moving forward the last thing to learn about the foramen magnum is the venous anatomy we are not going to go into very detail of this venous anatomy but just uh, to summarize this the venous anatomy in the region of foramen magnum is divided into three groups one group is composed of the extradural veins another is formed by the intradural veins just neural veins and a third constitute is constituted by the dural venous sinuses so we have three types of venous structures around the foramen magnum the extradural intradural and dural venous sinuses and simplify the picture we have as we can see we have three type of 
vena structures here. The one in purple. This is the main sinuses. As we can see in fetal petrosal sinus, it forms a jugular bun and bulb, and then from jugular to buccal, it runs as a sigmoid. The sigmoid channels and then going to run as an internal jugular vein. Then we have the vertebral venous plexuses or the external arteries, which are going to be joined by the sinuses by via emissary veins, emissary veins. And then we will have the one in green. We have the neural venous structures, the one which are going to be present intradural. So the intradural, the extradural, and the main sinuses they are going to be connected with each other at the foramen magnum. So that's all about the foramen magnum. We started with the osseous anatomy, then we move forward to the muscular ligament, neural anatomy, and we ended it with the vascular anatomy. Any questions? Thank you, Doctor Riva, for such a detailed presentation. I would like now like to request Professor Charyan to uh, give his expert uh, uh, opinion and maybe share some cases if we have them. Uh, Professor Charyan. Yeah. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can, sir. Okay. Right. Uh, again. The standard of uh, presentations in this uh, series, I think it's uh, really world-class. So I must congratulate Salman and uh, Saad for this, and of course, all the residents. So I would say it's one of the best in the world. I can, uh, I mean, I have seen only a couple of them, but, uh, but there are some points where you can make it better. Now, I would like to suggest you, I would like to show you something. I'm going to share my screen. Right. So, uh, yeah, so this is one case I thought I'd show you. This, uh, but before that, I wanted to actually show you something called Sketchfab. Uh, let's look at it. I hope this doesn't take or take me off from the Zoom. So look at this Sketchfab. Okay. Now I let me search for a model. So for example, let me search for an endo endoscopic model. So this is something. Ah. Okay, so I got this. You seeing this? Yeah. All of you? Okay, now this is from Stanford. This is precisely the kind of work we're planning to do because uh, this is done with a scanner. And what it does is it gives you a virtual reality picture. Now, when you are talking, uh, what you can do is you can put this picture and then you can work around. So for example, uh, I'm gonna zoom into, it's not, uh, unfortunately it's, yeah, it's rotating, but it's, uh, it's a bit slow because I got, uh, I think a lot of things working on my laptop. So what I wanted to show you is C. That's a, that's a basilar artery. That's a carotid artery. And if I zoom it, actually it is, I don't know why I'm not able to zoom it, uh, but all of, in all of your computers, you can, okay? Now, if you zoom it, the level of details is just amazing. That's a pituitary, okay? So, that's a uh, uh, basilar, that's a brainstem. Uh, now you have C4 carotid, that is the horizontal intracavernous, then C, uh, you have the C3 carotid here, then C2 carotid. This is uh, really in virtual reality. And when you are doing a anatomical study, if you can find sketch fab images, it will be fabulous. And plus, neurosurgery coach along with uh, Krishna, we've already got an Esculap Academy, probably one of the first in Asia. 
And we would want to do this and we want to scan these uh, dissections that we're doing. So we're getting injected cadavers. Dr. Tamalan Konyev is with us. So he's trying and doing this. We have this fresh cadaver program in donation program also in our place. So we are injecting these cadavers with latex. And then after that, we'll dissect. And then we'll scan, not with the microscope, but scan. We use an oral scanner and scan and get these kind of images. And then what we can do is, It'll be like a VR environment where you can just zoom in. You can even put your glasses, oculus on and then do it. So this is one point I want you guys to take up because the standards here are amazing. I mean, and if you can do that, then you could kind of uh, make it even better. And plus, I was thinking maybe I would be honored to partner with you guys uh, with the neurosurgery coach program. So if we can have a neurosurgical anatomy session, like, you know, take it one step ahead of what uh, Professor Roten was doing, which means he was doing it in 3D. We do it in uh, scanned VR images. And we, uh, every month or something, we can have a discussion um, on a case related or unrelated, unrelated and go on to details. Like right now, what we're doing is we're doing the foramen magnum completely. And the foramen magnum is such a huge, if you have to cover all the topics that you covered today, it will take at least four sessions. So I understand that you're doing an overview right now and that that's a way to go, of course. But uh, maybe the next round when we do it, we could do it a much more detailed micronet. And I can, uh, if you guys are interested, I can get uh, the whole world involved. I mean, we could uh, get... Uh, so many young neurosurgeons are in, uh, interested in young, uh, I mean, in uh, neurosurgical anatomy, pure neurosurgical anatomy, and sharing one case. So we can have uh, many people as experts. I, I see that you're doing that. So that's one suggestion I had. Now, I it seems going... like an uh, sorry to cut, but seems like an excellent idea. And obviously, the dissection, the level of dissection, and the images, I think, will help not only the resident in Pakistan but also all over the world. So I think uh, we can uh, collaborate with you on this will be an honor. And I think we can talk about this um, uh, later, how to go about things. Yeah, so um, I would love to do that. And then um, another, so on a different note, I'm just showing you a case that uh, we did recently. So this was a giant cavernous segment uh, aneurysm. So, uh, generally, if it is cavernous segment or transitional segments, we clip it. We we don't put any flow diverters or anything. Um, I don't believe that these things are for our countries because uh, these things are very, very costly. And most of the people doesn't have health insurance. And uh, if you keep on putting FDs uh, all the time, you will forget some of the skills that you need to. So... This was, uh, this aneurysm was arising from the dorsal aspect of the cavernous segment and uh, it's definitely not clippable. Um, if I try to clip it, I may be compromising the carotid uh, to an extent and uh, also the third nerve, fourth nerve and uh, sixth nerve, which was clearly intact in this case would be obviously uh, disturbed, I mean. Well, uh, if there's a bleed or something, you can, of course, manage it. It's not a big problem. But then a much easier way is to check with a BTO whether this patient is failing the BTO. And if the patient is failing the BTO, you do a high flow. The patient is not failing a BTO. Then you see how the filling is. If the filling is delayed, then you go for a low flow. The filling is okay. Ideally, you could go for a Hunterian ligation after a hypotensive challenge. So uh, in this case, our feeling was uh, slightly uh, delayed and therefore we usually will see what we did. So it's just a six minute video. You can see the giant aneurysm there. You can see that? Yes, yes we can. Yeah, so that's the aneurysm. And uh, you know, the carotid is very much patent here. It's uh, not that it's just filling by cross filling. The carotid is very much patent here, you'll see that. Uh -huh. So, yeah, so the cross filling showed that there was a delay. So we went ahead, we, uh, we marked the ST and then we harvested uh, Dr. Saji, who's also here. Um, 
he is uh, joined this uh, uh, meeting. He uh, he harvested the ST here, and uh, we are uh, just preparing the ST. This is something that uh, one of the things that I want to tell the young neurosurgeons is, uh, you know. If anybody tells you stroke surgery is only about aspirin, I mean, stroke is only about aspirin and uh, clopidogrel, uh, not right. Huh? Uh, there are some indications. And in our countries, if you take the numbers, these are huge. And uh, so secondary moya moya and uh, chronic uh, TIAs, sometimes it really helps to do a STMs if you select your patients correctly. Um, then... In, in these kind of cases, if you can do an STN, it's not a big surgery. It's, 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 a, um, it's a rather, uh, you know, it requires some skills level, but it can be practiced. It's nothing big, actually. So we're doing it with an exoscope here. Uh, we, uh, I like magnifications. Earlier, we got the Pentero customized to get a 42 mag. So now with the exoscope, when I want, I have the 100 mag. So this is an M4 vessel. It doesn't look like an M4 vessel. See how big it is. It's, and those uh, small vessels, they are micrometers. So you disconnect all those vessels away from the main trunk. This is very important in preventing spasm. So you don't want to bipolar them just next to the vessel. So these are micrometers. These vessels are micrometers. So uh, this is a 0.6 uh, millimeter uh, graft and uh, a 0.5 millimeter uh, M4. So you prepare the graft and under very, very high magnification, you can see all these micrometer vessels, see how prominent they are. And uh, key to good neurosurgery is of course, high magnification. You should never forget that. I see a lot of uh, people doing uh, uh, a lot of procedures with low magnification. It's good to see. I always go uh, zoom in and out because I don't get disoriented. But uh, when you're doing something, you should do it under the highest magnification. So we are uh, uh, opening the uh, M4 segment here and uh, staining it under very, very high magnification, of course. And then uh, here, I didn't really have to fish mouth. I mean, if you think that fish mouthing is uh, has to be always done, it's not necessary. So uh, yes, sometimes it does help, but uh, uh, or not always. You need to look at the caliber of the of each vessel, and then you do these anastomoses at very high magnifications. Um, fish mouthing is not all the time necessary. I uh, have been uh, seeing. Uh, anastomosis from all over the world and you know you you do a few and then you you tend to develop uh, things which are uh, which works for you so that's how you see a technique and it's always not that that you copy the technique uh, verbatim so you tend to see it and then you 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 think for yourself as to what works best for you and uh, uh, that's what you should you should adopt and we 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 not uh, all identical people. We have different perspectives, and that that's what makes the world beautiful. You see, so we go ahead, get those heel stitches and in, and the toe stitches in, and then you start um, doing the difficult side first. The difficult side is the one away from you. So you keep. Um, I do both. Uh, sometimes I do interrupted. Sometimes I do. Um, uh, run, con running continues, but if I'm not in a hurry to do it, I always do interrupt it. So uh, even if I'm in a hurry, I mean, in anastomosis surgery, there's no hurry at all. That's that's one thing. Uh, the word hurry is a taboo. Okay, so you got to be in that very lazy mood to do this. And um, so you can see how it's done. And you can see the uh, once you take this the filling, uh, you back bleed once. When one stitch is there, you back bleed. You can see beautifully filling, and you can see with the you can see the anastomosis site now here beautifully filling. 
and that is going into i mean this is after the catheter is occluded so you can see how beautifully the, the terminal uh, branches of uh, mca the the further generations are filling so she went what went back walking so this is and you can see the carotid completely occluded white carotid here they occluded in the neck and occluded uh, uh, i mean occluded uh, in at uh, the optical carotid junction optical carotid region we found out the most proximal part and then occluded it so uh, that's how it was done uh, the aneurysm was not open because there was no cranial no palsy, no pressure symptoms as such. So it was there was no need to open it. So that's I'll stop sharing right now. And as I said, um, one of the things I'd really like to go ahead with you guys is that we I would like to collaborate with you guys. Maybe Saad and Salman, we can sit down together and we can uh, discuss how we can. Uh, collaborate together with neurosurgery coach and this anatomy program is just brilliant so we can make some changes to it and then um, would you be open to um, Saad and Salman would you be open to uh, people from other parts of the world presenting on this I mean I don't know whether they can keep up with definitely, your standards we, yeah definitely we've had people presenting from Europe previously we have had other presenters as well so I think uh, yeah we will be open to other people presenting with, take some load off our residence as well. Yeah, great. But uh, I really don't know if anybody can keep up to these standards which uh, with the two ladies who I've seen them present over the last uh, we presented you with the best, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I'm really proud of this. And so, so, we, so. Would, we would want to keep up the same standards. So, we will have a series where we can use some sketch fab. We can because we have this Esculap Academy right now. We're doing dissections almost every month. We have courses every month. So uh, neurosurgeons come to us. We're trying to improve our facilities to injected uh, cadavers right now. So we have a guy who's doing it for us. And we're getting the freezers and we're getting everything. So no formalin, uh, good tissue planes and things like that. So we're getting it all done here in Krishna. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to get a 3D exoscope for the lab. I mean... Uh, S-clap is not yet. We've got it for our theater, but uh, once the second generation comes, maybe at least I can get a first generation exoscope for the, the visuals are stunning. So maybe we can later on get it like 3D. Defin definitely. I think this is something we need to discuss. And I'll, uh, uh, I've already had a discussion of Salman and he kept it really open as to whatever you want to do. So I'll, uh, I'll write you an email uh, just after the session and then we can all, uh, uh, you know, we can coordinate and maybe, you know, and definitely this is going to help not only our residents, but residents around the world as well. And obviously you're doing great work at Krishna and we'll be happy to collaborate. Uh, excellent case though, um, um, I, um, you know, uh, the one that, that you just showed. And I would, uh, if the participants have any questions, we, this is the time. Uh, we'd love to, uh, we'd love to have uh, Dr. Professor Charyan is here. And if there's any question, you can use the chat box. If not, you can then, ask uh, me directly. You guys I mean, can ask the, me directly. The thing is, uh, thing is that uh, they, they are all muted. And so, oh, okay. uh, so, so, they, so they normally use the chat box. But I think that Ariva has done a good enough job that there is no questions. Is there? If there's any question, guys, this is the time. Professor Charyan is here just for you guys. Uh, if not, then we'd like to uh, conclude this session. Um, I don't think there are any questions. Uh, Professor Charyan, I'll write you an email uh, with Dr. Salman and Loop, and then we can all uh, we can uh, definitely discuss what you have in mind, and you know we can start that. And um, you know maybe we can have presidents from India and other parts of the world. So uh, there's a question from Bush, Dr. Busha, and um, if the, uh, yeah, I saw that. Take, yeah, you saw that, right? Yeah. So if there are symptoms of compression of nerves, then after I trap the aneurysm, I would go transcavernous and I'll open the aneurysm. This we we could easily do that. So um, we have done that many times, and uh, maybe if you are interested, any time I can show you how we go transcavernous. If you have time, I don't know if you have time right now. So maybe I will have some, I can have some videos, uh, but then I don't think there's time right now. Yeah. I, I, if you I think, think I, um, 
if you, uh, I think if you have the video right now, maybe. Uh, I, I have the video right now. So I, I'll show you how we go cavernous, trans cavernous, and uh, maybe. Uh, Maybe I'll just select something trans cavernous so that you see how we open the cavernous sinus. Just that. Okay. Trans cavernous. It's opening. I need to share, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, sharing now. It'll be one minute. So I can just show you how. We, you've seen it? I mean, you you starting to see it? Yeah, we are. Right. So let's skip all that. Let's skip all. Uh, so that's exactly how you go trans cavernous. I mean, I have shown this in Pakistan many times. Uh, I left to get the sound off. Uh, you can see the optic nerve there. You can see the third nerve, uh, the fourth nerve, V1 uh, there, the V2 there. That's a clinoid getting out. So that's a roof of the cavernous sinus. Uh, and uh, this is optic nerve. This is the intradural, intradural carotid. Ah, so that is uh, again, we are going into the cavernous sinus there. I mean, let me just, ah, yes. So, um, that is V1, that is V2, and uh, uh, that is V3. Always remember V3 and V2 are at uh, almost 90 degree. So V1 and V2 are at 30 degree, and V2 to V3 is almost 90 degree. So you must remember that 60 to 90 degrees. So that's how you identify uh, if beginning. So um, so I just wanted to show you how we get into the cavernous sinus. These are all different aneurysms. Ah, yes. So here we had a dural AV fistula, which was arising from the C5 segment, the paraclival segment of the ICA. The paraclival ICA segment can always be found in the Parkinson's triangle, that is between the fourth nerve and the V1. So that's the paraclival ICA. That, that ICA is actually perpendicular. So I'm going to, I mean, you cannot bipolar there because the sixth nerve is right here. If you're bipolar, you can get a six nerve palsy. So you've got to clip the, uh, here it was two branches were there. So I clipped both the branches arising from the, uh, the paraclival uh, ICA, which is inside the cavernous sinus, of course. So you can see the, the paraclival ICA, which is behind the V3 one, and then those were the branches. So uh, that is how we enter the cavernous sinus. We could enter through uh, the Parkinson's triangle and uh, and then we could just uh, open the aneurysm. Once I remember I opened the aneurysm, I had, a, although I had trapped it for some reason, there was a huge bleed. So we had to pack a muscle patch into it and the uh, patient did well, there was no problems, but you got to be careful. I think instead of directly opening, you got to put a needle in and see how it is. A needle stick is much more easy to manage than a, a direct straight opening. So although you have trapped it off sometimes, I don't know, maybe extracranial to intracranial uh, communication. So that's probably why that carrot may be getting bled. So this is how, this is the answer to your question. I hope that answers your question. I, I think it does. Uh, uh, thank you again for such uh, excellent work and uh, the videos. And uh, if, there's, uh, if there's any, if there's no more question, I think uh, we'd like to con uh, conclude the session because we're right at the end. Uh, thank you, Professor Charyan, and uh, I'll, I will be getting in touch with you uh, maybe today, and we can discuss, and, um, um, you know, uh, thank you for uh, joining this session. It shows your interest towards education to, uh, in neurosurgery, and uh, it was an honor to have you, sir. I'll see you all next week. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, sir.